I believe. Um, Ashley, are you recording? Oh uh, yeah, I just pressed it. Okay, great. All right, so now we're recording. Um, anyway, can we go to the, yeah, thanks. So if you guys don't mind clicking on the chat uh, to sign in so we can get your contact information, that would be great, appreciate it. Um, and like I said, my name's Drew Kane. I'm the land use planner with Community Development Department and we are just beginning this planning process called our Cambridge Street. And we're glad to have you guys here tonight. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So we wanted to lay out some basic rules of engagement, so to speak, for this presentation this evening. Um, it's gonna be about an hour long, uh, all told. We will go over sort of a summary of what we're doing with this project and what we've done to date. Um, also present some of the existing conditions analysis and issues. Um, and a lot of what we've heard so far in a public engagement of events and then leave room for discussion at the end. Um, and you guys are here, so you're all familiar with Zoom already. Um, you've managed to make it this far, which is great. So if you can stay muted until you're called on, we'll get plenty of time at the end for questions, but in the time for the time being, if you don't mind just staying muted so we don't get any background noise, that would be great. Um, if you wanna keep your video on, that's great. We'd love to see you. If you don't feel like keeping your video on, you do not have to. Um, for all questions and comments, please use the chat while we're presenting. Uh, we'll go back to the chat later and begin to sort of mine some of the questions that do pop up. Um, and when we do get to Q&A, feel free to raise your hand using the reactions button. You'll see a little raise hand bar. We'll call on you and unmute you, and then we can um, go into your question that you might have. If you go to the next slide. So here are some quick guidelines. As I just mentioned, if you'd like to ask any questions by the microphone, please raise your hand first, the bottom of the screen. We'll call on you. Um, if there are any folks that are calling in tonight, just press star nine to raise your hand. We'll read out the last four digits of your phone number and let you know and give you then time to speak. Um, and we really do wanna give as many people as possible time to be heard tonight. So ideally we'd like to limit questions to about two minutes per person and also try not to repeat questions too frequently um, to leave room for other folks to sort of step forward and ask their questions. And again, yeah, all comments and questions in the chat will become part of this meeting record. So we are inventorying everything that we're hearing from you guys, whether it's recording or in the chat, and we'll be sure to have that posted on our website this week. And a little bit about our team tonight from CDD, um, from the city of Cambridge, it is myself, Drew Kane. I'm again, the land use planner with the community development department. Um, Melissa Peters, who's our director of community planning is also here. Um, she'll be presenting some of this work as well. We also have Lev McCarthy, who's a neighborhood planner at CDD, and he's been helping out uh, day to day on this project. And we've also got a great consultant team we've been working with, um, Interface Studio out of Philadelphia. And so some of you folks that came to our pop-up events had a chance to meet them. Um, they've been wonderful. You know, we had, 13 teams that we got proposals from. We interviewed half a dozen and we selected them because we really thought they had a very um, meaningful and thoughtful approach to community engagement. And we really wanted this to be as much of a neighborhood plan as anything else. Um, so this really worked with the sort of scale of plans that they work on and their focus on community process. Um, Ninigrit Partners is their economic development consultant focus on small business. Consulticon is the real estate development consultant. Um, they'll be looking at housing. And Bureau Happold, who the city's worked with before on the climate change and vulnerability assessment, is helping them with mobility and climate change issues. Go ahead, Ashley. Um, to give you a brief overview for tonight, um, we will sort of give you an outline of the project goals and the schedule for the project. Um, Melissa will go over that a little bit because it builds off some of the conversations we had in Envision Cambridge. Um, which is sort of the origin of this project. Um, we also wanna give you a recap of the engagement of what we've done today, what we're calling engagement by the numbers. Um, so sort of give you an overview of what we heard at our various pop-up events, through our interviews, surveys, et cetera. Um, and we wanna talk about some key issues. And some of these are conversations we've had out in public and on the street. Um, some of it is also analysis and existing conditions assessment that Interface has been working on. So you might get a combination of things. Um, so if anyone missed the pop-up events, we're here to have some of that same sort of dialogue. So you haven't missed much in that sense. Um, but some of the analysis is going to be new for everybody. 
Um, and we're excited to dive into that with you a little bit. Um, after we go through those key issues or existing conditions assessment, we'll talk about next steps for this project and what the next couple of months will hold. So we're going to do a quick poll here. Um, you know, Cambridge Street touches on three really significant and unique neighborhoods um, between Mid Cambridge, Wellington, and East Cambridge. Um, and everyone here is here for a reason. They consider Cambridge Street to a bit of, a bit of their main street. That's why we call it our Cambridge Streets. So we want to know what your relationship to Cambridge Street is. So take a minute and answer these questions if you don't mind. And I realize we only gave single choice, so this could be multiple choice for many people. That should have that should have been a multiple choice option, or pick more than one rather. Um, but that's great. We we see that a lot of the folks that are here tonight live or uh, live near Cambridge Street, which is really important to us. Um, some of you work, some of you own a business, a lot of you shop, and others. So that might just be folks that like to take a walk in the neighborhood. Um, so we can go ahead and end that poll. We'll move on to the next part of the presentation. Great, thanks, Drew. Um, hi, everyone. Melissa Peters, Director of Community Planning. I'm going to go over quickly why we're looking at Cambridge Street um, from Inman to Lechmere Square um, and talk a little bit about what we've been up to since um, bringing out the consultant in, in September, October. So first, um, Envision Cambridge laid out a growth management framework for how and where Cambridge would change over time. Um, and ca the Cambridge Street corridor was identified as area that was is experiencing and will continue to experience significant development pressure. So we all know the development pressure that's happening in Boynton Yards and Union Square, um, the continued pressure from Kendall Square and how that impacts the Cambridge Street corridor from both an infrastructure and transportation perspective, but also a housing um, and business perspective as well. And one of the things that Envision Cambridge did was laid out these high level goals of how to guide our future growth so that it's inclusive, that's sustainable, um, and that it benefits all people. And as we start to look at these areas of change at a more local level, it's an opportunity to have those more concrete conversations about trade-offs. Um, and what we really wanna do is continue to, in the forefront of our minds, advance goals of Envision while, while recognizing that um, there are trade-offs um, and, and decisions that need to be made and, and really hearing from the community of how do we want to shape and manage that change. So we don't have a preconceived notion of how that change um, it will happen. We do know change is coming and that we want transit-oriented, equitable, and inclusive development and really want to hear from the community um, to, to make this uh, an inclusive plan. So, so what is this for? for? As for any plan, it's to create a shared vision uh, from, of a community uh, for the future, to coordinate our, our public policy and spending, um, to create partnerships and opportunities and, and to have um, an investment plan. So really um, having that shared consensus among the community so that um, we can advocate and lobby together for, for the same change that we're seeking. So we are um, aiming for a 12 month process. Um, we know planning fatigue is real and we want to make this meaningful um, and efficient and, and really get to results and action. And so um, since we um, hired Interface Studio, um, they've been deep doing a deep dive into data analysis, learning, getting to know the study area, um, meeting local stakeholders, um, we just finished a round of engagement. Um, excited to see so many people on this meeting. Um, we'll go through some of the engagement numbers in a bit, but I think we were around 450 people have completed an online survey, which is phenomenal. Um, and that's really going to inform um, what is the next phase of like, what is our draft approach? What are the uh, future scenarios and options? How do we want to balance future development and change and, and um, and manage our, our variety of goals, um, and then ultimately go into um, what is our strategy for develop, um, you know, a, a strategy plan, 
um, and then into implementation. So I will say it's, um, Drew had mentioned at the beginning that there's a, a link in the beginning in the chat to a, a survey about just introduce uh, who you are and some demographic survey. That's really important information that helps us make sure that we have a wide ranging inclusive engagement process. So if we find that we're reaching certain types of uh, communities uh, via public meetings or focus groups or street canvassing, um, we can we can change course or do more of another to make sure that what we are hearing is representative of the community. So we do really appreciate that feedback. So so far, um, we've been very busy. We've been uh, we've held thirty interviews um, with neighborhood groups, business associations, business owners, longstanding community groups. Um, city staff really trying to get the consultant team um, and the city to understand what are the various perspectives, stakeholders, um, understanding um, of, of the, the, air, the street. Um, um, Jason Ellis gave a, a, a great a tour um, from his perspective, it was super valuable. Um, in addition to this public meeting, we also think it's super valuable to go where people are, um, maybe where they're not expecting to get more of a diverse um, range of opinions. So we've had uh, um, pop-in events. Um, we were at the Volpe Block Party. We went to Miller's River Senior Housing. We've been to Inman Square, um, more of the Wellington Harrington area, and then also in East Cambridge. Um, and then, as I had mentioned, with, there is an online survey, and we've received so far 426 responses, it looks like, and, and that's ongoing and will be open through the end of the year. So um, if you haven't completed that already, please do so. Here's some of the, some photos of our engagement. And, and what we've heard so far. So we've um, heard a variety of different opinions. Um, uh, there's some overlap, of course, with depending on who you're talking to, residents and businesses. But I think what, you know, what's clear is that, you know, this is a, a unique, place. I, ha I happen to, to live on Cambridge Street as well, so it's very special uh, to my heart. Um, and, you know, people love um, kind of the, the local businesses, um, kind of the legacy businesses that are there, diverse, um, the active street fronts, really people were really supportive of outdoor dining that happened that emerged out of COVID, how we can keep that activity and liveliness on the street. There is concern about all the development that's happening outside of our borders in Somerville, um, what that means, particularly if it's office and lab for um, um, housing affordability, that, that if we do have development uh, on the Cambridge corridor, there is a preference for housing, but that it should be affordable. And people particularly talked about the need for um, affordability in the middle income range. Um, and then of course, um, you know, the elephant in the room is the um, cycling safety ordinance and the conflicts that are inherent with um, a separated bike lane um, and, and what that means and the challenges, you know, recognizing the importance of bike safety and sustainable infrastructure, um, but also that there, there are conflicts with curb management given all the things that the curb needs to do, loading, pickup, parking, um, and how can we do this without um, in the best way possible, like if, if parking is lost, parking is important for businesses. Um, how do we provide parking in other ways and really being creative so that we can um, make the most of, of the mandate that's coming forward. Um, and then obviously, you know, COVID has been really hard for our business community. Um, there's, we've lost a lot of businesses, we want to save them. How, how can we continue to save those unique businesses that make um, and call Cambridge Street home? So with that, I will pass it off to Stacy from Interface Studio to introduce herself and lead the next few slides. Thank you. Um, my name is Stacy. I'm, I'm from Interface Studio, and I'm going to lead us through um, the key issues and the key question that we kind of want to answer, right, is how can Cambridge Street evolve yet still retain what it make, what makes it unique? We are, we're really 
we have a lot of um, expectations for this street and we, we really want it to do a lot. Um, so let me walk you through in the next slide, some of the key questions. So one of the things we are trying to understand is who are the users of Cambridge Street and how can all of them be accommodated? Um, and by all of them, I also mean, you know, how can Cambridge Street support the city's goals for climate action and resilience? Um, and then finally, you know, where are the development pressures and how will they impact the street? Next, please. So there's a lot of information that we're gonna go through. I'm going to go rather quickly to give you a, a high level overview, but as mentioned, we will be providing these slides for you on the website to download and digest in your own time. So don't worry. Um, but the first thing I wanna walk you through is who uses Cambridge Street? Lots and lots of different users. Um, we took a look at the uh, five minute and 10 minute walk sheds as, as our guide. So again, just to remind you, we're looking at Cambridge Street from Inman Square to Lechmere. And we looked at a five minute walk shed to try to define like the closest. And that's the darker orange that you see here on this map. And it actually bleeds right into Somerville too, right? Because Somerville is just across the line, but people in Somerville come to Cambridge Street. So um, these are just some, you know, the snapshot of who um, is within a five minute walk shed of this, of this street. However, we are also interested in the 10 minute because, you know, if, you, if you're a resident here, a 10 minute walk is, you know, a reasonable amount of time that you would be spending to, to be getting around. Next slide, please. So here is just a snapshot of that, of that five minute walk shed in terms of the residents. What we were interested in is looking at how does it, how does it compare to the city as a whole? And, and it really tracks pretty closely in terms of age and income. There are slightly more seniors um, in our area. Our, we have 13% of the population share our seniors versus the cities, which is 11%. Um, there are a couple of senior housing developments right on Cambridge Street, so that's not a surprise to us. Um, there's a slightly lower income than the city as a whole. However, it, tra it has been tracking over the past uh, 30 years very closely with, with Cambridge's um, median household income. Um, and rising over the years pretty steadily. What we did discover is that there's a bit of a jump in this last decade. So from 2010 to 2019, which is when the latest estimates um, came out, there was a much higher jump in income than in previous decades. So that is perhaps of interest and maybe anecdotally, some of you may you know, feel that that is the case. But in, in other respects, this neighborhood is very similar to the city of Cambridge as a whole. Next slide, please. So something that we are also really interested in is how this, this area has changed over time. So we have heard, you know, this neighborhood has always been a quite a diverse part of the city and a destination, a gateway for immigrants. Um, so this chart here shows you over the last couple of decades, we started in 1980, um, how race and ethnicity has changed over time. And you can see the, the legend um, on the right is color coded. So you can see what the share, both the absolute number and the share of the population that's changed over time. What we did was match that with the foreign born population. So we know this is a destination um, for immigrants in the city. Over the last um, couple of decades, it has consistently been about 28 to 30% of the population of this neighborhood is foreign born. What's interesting is that's basically the same percentage as the city of Cambridge, but the city of Cambridge as a whole has kind of caught up with this neighborhood. So now we're, they are on par. What has also changed over time um, is the places of origin. So the countries of origin, of, of new immigrants in this area. So as you can see in 2000, um, the, the top country is Portugal, 19% of the foreign born population came from Portugal. And over the last couple of decades that has shifted a bit so that in 2019, the latest estimates, um, the, the top countries are, are countries in Asia. So China and India specifically. If you look at the green band in the race and ethnicity chart, you will see that since 2000, that share of the population has also grown. So those, those things are tracking. So we're aware of these changes. However, we're also you know, very cognizant that this is a destination, um, not just for residents, but also for business owners, right? And it has always been a place um, for, for business owners to open their business. The other user group we're interested in are the workers of this corridor. So over 14,000 people work within this five minute walk shed of Cambridge Street from Inman to Lechmere. The circles on this map show where they are coming from, where they are commuting from. So you'll see a lot appear to be coming from Alewife, um, 
that's a very large circle, but a lot are also clustered um, in and around Cambridge Street itself. However, beyond the 14,000 or so workers on the street itself, there are approximately 26,000 people who are coming in to and from Cambridge Street for work. So they're either traveling from outside or they're living around Cambridge Street and traveling elsewhere. So there's just a lot of movement of people on Cambridge Street. And that gets to commuters, right? So that's another user group that we are aware of. There are commuters who are traveling by bike, by car and by transit. And so that's another user group that we are keeping in mind. Next slide. Um, and then we don't want to forget flora and fauna. This is a really important thing is, you know, Cambridge Street is a habitat um, for, for things other than humans. So we are aware of that as well. And we're thinking about a healthy tree canopy um, and native vegetation and how that's very important, um, not just for the humans, but also for some of the other fauna that live um, on Cambridge Street. And before I go into the last um, big user group, which is businesses, we're gonna do a quick poll to see what you guys think is the most common ground floor use on Cambridge Street. Again, from Inman Square all the way to Lechmere. And we did an inventory of every ground floor use. So we'll see how close you guys are. Another second. So it looks like people are choosing restaurant as the number one use retails close second there all right i think everyone's probably had a chance okay so restaurant retail then office all right so in actuality office is the number one use that we counted on the street um, 53 out of 225 businesses that we counted along the entirety of the street. Restaurants number two, 39, um, and then salons, services, and retail. Um, next slide gives you a little bit of a zoom in. So there's a lot of stuff on this map. I don't expect you to look at every dot and like figure out what's going on, but I did want to make two points. One is that um, if you look at the zoom ins, um, the one on the left, the circle on the left is a zoom into Inman Square, right? And you'll see a lot of pink and purple. That's really where the concentration of restaurant, cafe, and retail is. I think most people, you know, would agree with that. That is kind of the center for those types of uses. Whereas if you look at the second circle on the right, that's really a mix of all different colors, right? So that means it's a mix of all different kinds of businesses. There's a lot more um, a variation, I guess you could say. And once you get past the school and library, um, moving east into East Cambridge, there really is a lot more of a, of a mix of all sorts of different businesses. And so this is important to us because the next slide, you know, this is kind of what makes Cambridge Street um, what it, the resilient street that it is and the neighborhood serving commercial street that it is, is the fact that it has such a mix of services and destinations. So we, we really want, you know, we heard a lot about people would like to see more restaurants and retail, but we also wanna make sure that we don't lose the neighborhood mix also, because this is really, you know, an important thing, um, not just for the services they provide, because, you know, if we, if we change it all, you know, in five years, people will be like, where are the services I need? You know, where, where, where's my yoga class? Where's my dog groomer? Where's my daycare? Um, but also because certain businesses also have very intense delivery needs, right? So that would change um, the character of the street as well. There's also a lot of very, very new and challenging retail trends that we're already in the midst of. Um, and a lot of retail coming in to the new developments um, at Boynton Yards, Union Square, in Kendall, at Cambridge Crossing. So these are all things that we wanna keep in mind as well as factors to consider. The other thing that's really important though is that we need to make a distinction between active uses and active street frontages. So for example, the, the, the picture here is from the architecture firm that um, is on Cambridge Street, took over the old toy mm -hmm. store. Um, we heard a lot about it, but their windows you know, are, are actually active street frontages. You know, they, they do have a relationship with the street. They, um, it, it, I think it is important to remember, you know, even if it's not what 
what some folks consider an active use like retail, like a toy store, there is still a relationship with the street that is really important and that adds and enhances your experience of the street. Um, another thing that we're really interested in is that, you know, even like even a use like a professional office does provide potential spillover activity. You know, for, for other businesses, they can be seen as customers. So it's a matter of thinking of what is that balance? Next, please. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Ashley, who's gonna walk you through how Cambridge Street does or doesn't accommodate all these different users. Sure, hi everybody. Um, so Stacy walked us through all of the different types of users on Cambridge Street, um, and now we're briefly going to talk about how they can be accommodated on the street itself. You know, how does the current layout of the street work? How does it support or not support its users? And of course, how does it support the city's climate goals? Um, and first, I want to touch on the mobility piece of the puzzle. Uh, Cambridge Street can get very congested. Um, it serves a lot of trucks and cars, um, as Stacy mentioned before, loading and loading zones, um, and even has a bus route. And I know a lot of things, a lot of these things that you are familiar with, but it really is key um, to think about how we're balancing those mobility uses with the other needs of the street. Um, and this diagram kind of walks through um, the different mobility users and, and how they kind of tie and land onto the street itself. Uh, we need to think about accommodating, accommodating pedestrians, bicyclists, and commuters. Uh, for pedestrians, we know the sidewalk space is very narrow on the street, um, and this really has an impact on people with disabilities. Um, the most common disability type, in fact, is mobility. It affects one in seven adults. And we have to remember that with age, disability becomes more and more common. Um, affecting about two in five adults age 65 and older. Um, we know anecdotally and from the data that there is a higher percentage of seniors living on the street. So that's a really important part of this study. Um, for bicyclists, we know that this corridor can be quite challenging to bike along, particularly for families with young children, as we heard a lot in our, our pop-up event. Um, we also need to consider the square footage for blue bike stations and places for safe bicycle parking. Um, and then the other piece there is the commuter piece, how our how are people moving through the street as a corridor? And obviously um, how long it takes to get through the street, but also the space for para paratransit and transit stops. Um, and I really love this photo to illustrate all of those different things <laughs> in one thing. There's a lot happening on this sidewalk space. Um, there's signs, there's street furniture like benches and bus shelters and bike racks and tree pits. Um, the sidewalks are narrow on Cambridge Street, only measuring about seven feet wide in many places. Um, this doesn't leave a lot of room for pedestrians or strollers or wheelchairs and ADA accessibility, of course, is a big concern. And many stores have um, a one step up with little curb space for accessible drop offs So we're really trying to think about, you know, how we can make these the most accessible they can be and accommodate all of those different uses. Um, and as Stacey mentioned before, there's a ton of businesses on the street. We know it's a, a large local business corridor. Um, in terms of thinking about accommodating businesses, uh, the space for loading and unloading is, is definitely a challenge here. Uh, we, but we also need to think about, particularly during the time of COVID, space for outdoor dining. You know, where is that square footage along the curb where we can steal a little bit for, for that use and help these businesses out. Um, again, ADA compliant storefronts. Um, we've also heard about ride chair pickup and drop off, particularly as like more destination type businesses come in, like large restaurants and bars. Um, and then there's the obvious one, the customer and employee parking. Um, we know that there's competition for parking spaces on the street, and we've heard a whole lot about that. Um, so again, just wanted to highlight and underscore the, the loading um, challenge and delivery challenges here. Um, as Drew mentioned before, we've spoken with a lot of local businesses on the street. We've heard that many um, businesses get multiple deliveries a day, sometimes five or six deliveries a day from a different type of truck or van. Um, and some of them are really large. So bev beverage deliveries, for example, come on 18 wheelers. Um, and you know, as shown in that diagram, there's no alley space here behind Cambridge Street. And so all of this has to happen in the street, street right away itself. And it's really, challenging us to think about how we can manage this um, really important use for businesses. You know, that it's kind of the lifeblood of their business to be able to get things in and out um, and how we can accommodate that moving forward. 
just want to touch on again, um, the outdoor space is a real lifeline for restaurants um, and continue to be really critical for their survival, particularly in the, in the time of COVID. Um, I think the street has already maximized as much kind of space they could steal in, in some of these leftover spaces on the street. Um, but there's also been discussion about maybe making some of these things permanent or thinking about them long term as, as an asset for people to really gather on the street. You know, where are the places where you can come and have a cup of coffee outside, sit with your friends, all of those things. Um, just another thing that's competing for space on the street. Um, and then lastly, um, the environment, as we mentioned, the city has really great um, targets for meeting their climate goals. Um, Cambridge Street itself has a lower tree cover compared to the citywide tree coverage of 25%, only at 13% in East Cambridge. Um, Cambridge Street was identified in the Urban Forest Master Plan to increase comfort in the summer and reduce heat island effect and um, help promote public transit and biking and walking. So, um, you know, all of those things sound great, but tree pits, when done properly, do take up a pretty good amount of space. Their roots um, fan out, and, and we need to think about how to engineer those properly so that they can get a really nice tree canopy. And in places where we can't necessarily squeeze in those proper size um, tree pits, how do we make sure that um, we, can, we are providing shade in, in other ways? So maybe some canopies or other different ways to reduce the heat island effect. And just to touch on uh, the public space factor a little bit, um, increasing vegetated spaces is also important to um, absorbing water and um, reducing the impact of heat. Um, but we know that there's really limited open spaces um, along the street itself. This is an, an image outside of the library. It's really beautiful. Um, but that was because the building was, when it was constructed, it was built set back a little bit to allow some of that breathing room. Um, so we really are looking at um, every kind of inch of Cambridge Street um, with a fine tube comb to find these opportunities and really think about maximizing the spaces we do have to help provide that open space that is currently really needed on the corridor. So um, this diagram looks a little bit crazy, but that is purposeful. Um, it's a really good summary of all of the things that are being asked of Cambridge Street right now, from the pedestrians, from the bicyclists, from the business owners, from the environment. Uh, it's a pretty narrow street and it has to accommodate all of these different things. Um, and it really just kind of tees up as where we're going about thinking about this. You know, how do we accommodate all of these different users? What are the potential trade-offs? Um, and how can we really make this street safer and greener? while supporting our local businesses that everybody um, loves and wants to continue supporting. And I'm just gonna touch on a little bit of um, the development pressures question because if, as if all of those different things weren't enough, um, we need to really consider all of the different development pressures impacting the market and housing and affordability. Um, so this map illustrates kind of the big development sites that are coming um, in the near future. There's a sub substantial amount of new development underway uh, near Com Cambridge Street with a mix of retail and residential and office and uh, research and development spaces. Um, over the past 20 years, um, there's been a lot of really large scale residential developments kind of all around East Cambridge and um, Cambridge Street. Um, but, you know, with these additional things, we're looking at just for Cambridge Crossing, for instance, that three and a half million uh, square foot of development equals about 1600 units. Cambridge side is adding 200 residential units, Kendall Square, another 1400 units. Uh, the courthouse is 50 units. Um, and it, in all, it totals about 3,300 units of residential development kind of bearing down on Cambridge Street and that will have impacts on affordability and housing and um, you know on the other side of this it's really also going to help maybe to support some of these smaller retailers that have been struggling um, with all of the residential development but there is impacts to consider um, which leads us to housing um, and the housing market we have a substance consultant on our team as mentioned before who's doing a really deep dive into housing and affordability um, and some of his major takeaways that he shared with us so far is that there's a really high cost of land and construction that drives up the housing prices. Um, parcels on Cambridge Street are pretty small, uh, which lends themselves to lower density construction, 
um, which I think is good in some residents' eyes. Um, but with that lower um, development footprint comes a higher construction price per unit, which helps to drive up costs. Um, and there's also this third piece that we've been hearing a ton about in that the market is really hot right now for lab and tech space. Um, and they can pay really top dollar for real estate and their, their new research facilities, um, but that can sometimes price out smaller retail businesses. Okay, so we just threw a lot of, at you. Um, and I think that sometimes we like to say, um, you be the planner. And so we're having to think about all of those different balances and all of those different needs. Um, so we're curious of what your biggest priority for Cambridge Street might be. Uh, I just shared another poll, a uh, quick poll. We have improving the pedestrian experience, making it safer and easier to bike, um, improving the public transit experience, increasing public space, new housing and supporting businesses and economic growth. I'm just gonna give you all a minute to think through that. Um, it should be pretty quick. And again, we purposely didn't let you choose more than one <laughs> in this particular poll because it's really interesting to see people's number one priority, even though this process will be considering all of those different priorities and how to balance them. But right now it looks like we're kind of tied between making it safer and easier to bike and supporting businesses and economic growth, uh, which anecdotally I will say is exactly the way our conversations with the community have been going um, so far. All right, I'm just gonna end this one. Um, it looks like someone is drawing. Interesting. <laughs> I don't know what that's about. All right, I'm gonna end it there. Um, Still tracking. I think within a, 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 a tie is pedestrian and then cyclists, which is, is interesting. Um, okay, so I'm glad we're still on time. Um, as we mentioned before, how do I, uh, who's drawing? Can they? <laughs> um, I can do this. There we go. Okay, everybody, um, don't draw. <laughs> don't draw on the screen. <laughs> Um, we wanted to leave a, a, the bulk of this meeting um, today here for you all to just ask us questions. If you have questions about the study, if you want to tell us um, things that you would like to see prioritized, things we should be thinking about. Um, it really is, you know, we're still in this first phase of, of our planning process. We're doing a whole lot of learning and listening. Um, and this is why we're here tonight. We're here to listen to you all, um, to hear your priorities and to hear the things that you love about Cambridge Street and want to see preserved, preserved or the things that could be made better. Did we miss anything in the challenges that we pointed out? Um, those types of things. Um, just a quick reminder of the guidelines for tonight's discussion. I was so glad to see um, almost 100 people register for this meeting. Um, but we really do wanna hear as, from as many of you as possible. So if you just raise your hand and I'll be unmuting you um, one by one. Um, try to keep your question or comment to two minutes um, as we move through this. Um, and if we can't get to everybody by 7.15, um, we'll make sure that all the chat is recorded so you can put your, um, your comment or question in the chat and we'll um, make sure we'll have everything recorded. Um, and post it on the website and FAQ and um, make sure that that is part of the meeting record. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing so we can see people's faces if you'd like to. And oopsie. So first up, we have um, Betty. Betty, I'm going to unmute you. Um, you should be able to uh, speak now. Hi, this is uh, Marie Sacoccio, not Betty. Betty's here with me. We're watching on the same computer. Um, it sounds to me as if this has really been an ongoing process. I live a block from Cambridge Street, and I just found out about this. Um, in, a, in a, an email from the city 
um, yesterday, in fact. And it seems like you've done a lot of data analysis and outreach, but I don't know where. Um, I'm an active participant at St. Francis of Assisi, which is on the corner of Sharapa and Cambridge Street. Uh, no one there has been contacted and we're quite concerned about losing parking. And um, I went to the pop-up for this a couple of weeks ago on Cambridge Street and there was a map out and someone had put um, a bus stop in front of the church. Um, so I'm not sure how this is proceeding or what your outreach really entails. Um, I certainly have not been part of it. Um, so I'm glad I logged on tonight so I can see what you're about. Yeah, absolutely. And we're happy that you logged on too. Um, yeah, and also I did, by the way, I tried to do the survey three times, that monkey survey, yeah. and it wouldn't take it. So I don't I don't know what's going on. Mm. Okay. Do, when you when you do the survey, do you verify whether or not people are actually from the district? Uh, we are recording um, people's addresses and neighborhoods, so we'll be able to track that. And we also have it set that um, only one person can submit a survey at a time. So uh, we are trying so to it's it's based on self-reporting. Uh, that's mean, essentially. Fair. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but just going back to process stuff, um, we really are in the beginning stages of our process. Uh, we've been working really hard um, since September 1st, but this is really our first really large public meeting. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. And so we've been um, doing all of this research to come, you know, prepared and, and to share a little bit about what we've been learning, but we're really in this first phase of community engagement. So uh, we've done some pop-ups along the street. We've talked to a lot of the different businesses and organizations, but we're still in phase one of learning. And so we're really glad that you joined us tonight and we will say you haven't missed much. Um, we can help um, connect you with Drew Kane to troubleshoot any survey issues. Um, you can even call him over the phone and he'll he'll walk you through it question by question, no problem. So uh, we're really happy to accommodate you if you're having any issues. Um, and thank you for your comments about um, the rest of the street. Um, yep. Next up, oh, sorry, go ahead, Drew. I can make one comment, uh, Betty. If you can get us in touch with anyone from St. Francis or St. Anthony's, we would love <laughs> to talk to them. I'm more than happy and would actively be interested in talking with um, the folks as part of the organizations there and the parishioners, because obviously a really important contingent that we want to speak with during this process. So I'm uh, always available and I'd love to touch base with you. Um, maybe after the meeting, you can just shoot me an email and we can make a contact. Uh, next up is Sharon DeVos. You should be able to unmute now, Sharon. There you go. Hey, Sharon, it looks like you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. All right, we're going to circle back to Sharon. Um, yeah. Next up, or oh. you could put your question in the chat too, just, you know, if that's easier. And also I just want to make a note, if some folks are uncomfortable speaking um, in front of everyone, you can also put your question in the chat and we will be, we will be bringing some of the questions from the chat into this Q and A as well. So that's another option if you don't want to talk in front of everybody. Uh, next is Michael Grill. Hi there, can everyone hear me? Yep. Great. Great, so um, uh, I'm the, the owner of 1035 Cambridge Street, which is at the corner of Columbia, Webster, and Cambridge Street. Uh, your slides uh, talk about the biotech and lab development pressures on the neighborhood, but um, everyone should be aware that uh, biotech and R&D and lab uses have existed in our building on Cambridge Street for many, many years. Um, and we've been doing that without affecting our residential neighbors in any substantial way. In fact, you could uh, say that our, the employees of our businesses and pre-COVID there were 350 people pouring out of our building every lunchtime, uh, support the, uh, the restaurants and retailers on Cambridge Street. So while there may be development pressures from biotech and lab, there's also benefits from those type of users um, along the Cambridge Street corridor. 
Thank you. That's a really great point. Uh, next up is Justin Sahith. Sahith? Hi, thanks. I appreciate you doing all the outreach before this meeting and uh, for holding the meeting. Um, I'm excited about the process. I know there's a lot to balance, but I do look forward to uh, uh, learning more. I, I know you have some some data on um, commercial space, and I'm wondering if you know you have any data on um, the amount of workers that you expect to be added to the area and uh, the commensurate need for housing that would arise out of that, because it seems to me um, in order to avoid further housing price increases while we're already under sort of a crisis situation, uh, we would need to add a significant amount of housing to balance that out. And um, I hope that uh, is one thing we can further explore as the study goes along. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the previous um, collection of slides we put together had about 20 different charts included. <laughs> Get those out of there, you know, for public consumption. So the the, the short answer is yes. Um, we are collecting all of that information, including um, the potential impacts of those developments, in addition to um, the amount of residential units, all of those different workers that are coming. Um, again, we have a pretty big team. It's just interfaces on this call tonight, but um, we have someone specifically looking at the market and the housing piece of the puzzle here. So we'll be sharing that out in the. On our website and uh, over the course of this project, Stacey, did you want to add anything there? Nope. I think that I think that is definitely um, one of our areas of focus, though. Um, next up is Caroline Lowenthal. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you um, so much for doing this. I think those were really great slides, a really great presentation. And like I said in the chat, I've um, been really impressed with this process. Um, so thank you all for, for doing such a great job. Um, I just wanted to voice my support for um, the bike lanes and pedestrian uh, friendliness. I um, am both a cyclist and a pedestrian. Um, every day on Cambridge Street, and um, and I, I think I'm also I push a stroller with my with my kids, and so it, it would be really great to not have to be sort of diving into tree wells um, when I'm trying to pass someone else with a stroller. Um, and then uh, I also just wanted to um, to bring up the there's a few empty spots um, along Cambridge Street, like there's the pit across the street from King Open School where the fire was like five years ago now. Is that, was that the five years ago fire? So I'm just wondering if, if that has to be a pit forever or if there's anything that the city can do um, for, for that and also a few other spots along Cambridge Street. Thank you. Um, before I kick that to Drew on, on the pit status, um, we did take an inventory of all of the vacant spaces uh, when we did that kind of surveying of all of the ground floor business uses. So um, again, another one of those things that got cut for, um, for speed, but um, we are looking at all of the opportunities along Cambridge Street as well, um, including all of those vacant spaces and vacant storefronts. And with respect to the state of the pit, um, Carolyn, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm happy to follow up for you so we can go see if we can get more information. And if there's anyone on the call who wants to raise their hand, if they have better intel, I would love to know because um, I'm curious too what's going to come of that. Every time I hear of a pit, I think of parks and recreation. Yes, <laughs> too. could be our very new version of that. Um, next up is Tony Kiebert. Uh, Tony, you should get a little thing that says, oh, there you go. Got it. Okay. Can you can I hear me? Yeah. Thanks. So um, I live in Wellington, Harrington, uh, just off of Cardinal Madero's Avenue. And I know that, and, and so Cambridge Street is the primary large street near, near us. Um, Wellington, Harrington, and East Cambridge, uh, where I don't live, and so 
forgive me if I'm speaking for them, we've both been impacted quite a bit by the all the, the construction going on in Kendall Square, uh, usually not to the benefit necessarily of our neighbors, more so to the developers. And so I just want to make sure that this project is aware of that and either by zoning or otherwise actively um, protects the, the housing, the neighborhoods just off of Cambridge Street um, because we've, we've been impacted quite a bit. And uh, I understood what Michael said about his place with the, the high tech folks, but there are lots of very tall for our neighborhood buildings nearby. And I'm concerned that, that this study might somehow or other further open the door to more tall buildings uh, looming over our, our homes. And so I just wanted to express my concern about that. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Go ahead, Ashley. Oh, I was just also gonna thank him. Go ahead. No, no, it's a very thoughtful comment and, and question. Um, obviously not our intent is to necessarily put any sort of development pressure to the degree that it would, you know, um, it really impact neighborhood residents. And so part of why we wanted to undertake this study is to, because we know that these are things that people do have concerns about. And we know how quickly things have transformed around Cambridge Street, around East Cambridge, Wellington, Inman Square, et cetera. So we're very conscious of that. And part of this process is to have the dialogue with the residents to understand exactly what you're saying. You know, where do they stand on these issues? And Cambridge Street hasn't had a plan done for it in 24 years. So we thought it was high time. It's very different than it was 24 years ago. So thank you for bringing that up. Sure, but 24 years ago, Drew, Kendall Square didn't exist in its current iteration. That's what and I mean. There sure. are implications for Cambridge Street now based upon the, the both the neighborhoods and and the, the buildings. Yeah, exactly, so just exactly my point, you're right. Yeah, and so I, I just, sorry, don't mean to beat you over the head, Drew, uh, but just so long as it's not just an observation of this group, but in my opinion, it should be an affirmative um, action to make sure that the, just off of Cambridge Streets, those neighbors off of Cambridge Street are protected. Thank you. Thanks. Um, next up, we have Louis or Luis, probably Luis. Hi. Good evening. Um, thank you, everyone. Can you? I, I assume you can hear me. Uh, all right. Uh, great. So, thank you so much for uh, really getting this process underway. Um, I met uh, Drew at the Volpe Day event a few weeks ago, and um, I appreciate the work that you guys have done thus far. Um, I use Cambridge, I live in Wellington, Harrington as well, um, and I use Cambridge Street on, on all modes of transit and, and transportation. I, I Usually, if I'm going to a business there, I walk there. Um, just a couple of days ago, I walked down to the Galleria to get my COVID test, um, and you know it was 20 minutes from where I live to get to the Galleria, so it, it's not a long distance. Um, but I also, I'll bike if I'm going into you know, someplace close in Boston, or if I'm going out of the area, I'll drive down Cambridge Street. And, and so I just recognize all of the, the potential conflicts that occur um, and really the, the need for safe uh, bike infrastructure because, um, you know, cars, drivers speed down Cambridge Street. Um, they, don't, they don't slow down. Big trucks pose a, a danger as well. Um, I think I made a comment that, you know, I really wish the city wouldn't do the curbside trash pickup during rush hour when there are more bikes who, are, who then have to leave the bike lane and go into the travel lanes and cars are crossing over the double yellow line, driving into oncoming traffic to pass them. So I really think that, um, you know, putting in protected uh, bike infrastructure, which can also be used by pedestrians and people with mobility issues. My mother uses a wheelchair, so you know a protected bike lane would be a great way for um, people who might have to use a wheelchair to to travel on on, on our streets. Um, 
so I, I also noticed the, um, you know, there are certain areas where there are dead zones, um, like the one of the other comment, commenters uh, stated, um, where there's just nothing happening on the street frontage. Uh, for example, the, the Vinfen building, which is just a, a parking lot, essentially, along Cambridge Street, which is not far from the pit. Um, it really is important to have you know, strong urban design guidelines as you know, new projects come online. And as a homeowner, I'm fortunate enough to be able to own my home. Um, I recognize the need for more housing and denser housing. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of uh, commercial development occurring and it's great that those workers are, are going to lunch and getting coffee at, at local businesses, but uh, more residents will be spending their money a lot more in the neighborhood as well. And we need more residents, uh, I, I think. So thank you for uh, the work you guys are doing. Look forward to this process continuing. Thanks, Luis, appreciate it. Uh, next up is Phyllis. Uh, you're muted, Phyllis. Okay. Okay. Sorry. All good now. Okay. So there are a couple of issues that I'm really concerned with. Um, one of them is that in terms of increasing um, pedestrian traffic, I would really like people to be thinking very creatively about ways to draw people in. And I'm going to give just one suggestion of something that I have suggested for Inman Square. I'm hoping that the city follows through. When the square finally gets resolved, I've asked the city to put permanent tables and chairs in the square. And what I really want is for the surfaces of those tables, a number of them, to have checkerboards like there used to be in front of Obon Pan. So there would be checkers or um, chess. So there would be a reason for people to come and sit there, not only because they'll bring their coffee or their ice cream, but that they'll sit and play checkers with their kids. Or, you know, just I just would like people to think creatively about things that will really bring people there. Um, a second thing is in terms of bikers. We have bikers whizzing through um, Inman Square, going in both directions, going from Beacon to Hampshire, uh, going to Kendall. Many of those bikers do not stop. They go flying through. So I really appreciate all of the safety measures that people are making for the bikers to be safe. And I'm a biker myself, but I'm just concerned that when an enormous amount of interest is being made to accommodate bikers, I wish that there was some way that we could entice the bikers to really um, patronize the businesses. So that brings up the businesses, which for example, when Elmendorf um, Bakery went in down in East Cambridge, um, I went and talked with them and said, you know, it would be wonderful to have you up closer to um, Inman Square. And they said they couldn't afford it. So the money factor is a huge issue. Um, the, they tried to uh, convince the owner of, I know two businesses who tried to convince the owner of what was Sandy's Market, which is now a tattoo space. Um, I tried to get the, the kids, um, what's it called? There's a, a, a children's clothing store um, that's in um, Davis Square and also in Porter Square. And I talked with him about bringing his business to the square because anything that's going to appeal to um, families with children, um, which the, the children's clothing store would do, you know, we, we just need to, to think so creatively about the businesses that we can help as a city support. And um, I know that um, there's been a lot of concern. The city manager is very concerned about um, our, our budget and our money, you know, but I say saving the city's money for a rainy day 
doesn't make any sense. We are in a hurricane. We are in a, a, a catastrophic um, event and saving it, we, we, need to, we need to loosen up the, the, um, the budget now and make it available to support those small businesses that wanna live there. And my last point has to do with blocking sun for residents who live just off of Cambridge. Cambridge Street. So as buildings go up, I would just like there to be a sensitivity. I will not be affected, but I know people who live one and two houses back. And if the buildings go up too high, they will be completely in um, these wells of um, blocked sunlight. So I very much appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Phyllis. Thank you, Phyllis. Um, and we have two more raised hands, and then uh, we can get on to next steps. Um, let's go with, oops, sorry. Uh, Mary Ellen Doran. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Mary Ellen Doran. I live down by the Gallery of Side Mall on Spring Street. Um, I actually live across from a really gigantic building. Uh, <clears throat> I really appreciate what you're doing with this study. I want to make two points. The first is please think electric vehicles and think about the vehicles that will be on the road in five to 10 years, one wheel, two wheels, three wheels, electrified, silent. Um, there's a lot of things that, that the city can take advantage of by utilizing what's coming down the pipeline for vehicle use. Additionally, uh, we have students, my son takes the bus to school. It would be great to have hop on, hop off down the length of Cambridge Street to help the businesses and to provide um, some much needed travel to try to get some of the cars off the street. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Um, next up is Caleb. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, thanks, Drew and Stacy as well for presenting. Um, learned a lot. Um, and I, I just want to uh, second uh, uh, Luis's comments that, that they, they really spoke to me. Um, I think for me, I'm a biker. I, uh, I, I spoke to Lev in one of the pop-ups. Um, so that's, that's my primary uh, mode of transportation, but I think housing and, and denser housing should be the primary focus, um, in my opinion. Um, there's you know, a parcel very near me that's, I think, ripe for it. Um, and it's just, um, I think the net positives of denser, um, denser housing, you know, however high they, they need to go, I, I understand they might um, uh, impede, um, um, you know, certain homes. You know, I live on Jefferson, which is a street away from Cambridge Street, so I may, may as well be affected by it. Um, um, I think more housing um, and more affordable housing um, is, um, is and should be the primary focus of, of, uh, of next steps. Thank you. Thanks, Gil. So okay. just, Ashley, just being mindful, it's five after seven, so that we might take a last couple questions. Is that what you're suggesting? And then we can wrap up for the evening, talk about yeah. next steps. Uh, yeah, there's there's um, one person who had their hand up a while ago. We tried before, but let's try Sharon one more time. Um, Sharon DeVos, if you can try to, I can see you now. Um, there you go. Oh, there's something wrong with your volume. We still can't hear you, Sharon. Yeah, um, unfortunately, we can't hear you. Hopefully, you can add your comments to the chat, and they'll be recorded. Um, and we definitely okay. yeah, we saw that comment in the chat. Okay. Sorry about that, Sharon. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, last one. Um, Joan Pickett. John, you're muted. I'm not sure if you're trying to speak right now. Hi there. Thank you so much for this process. I think it will really engage the residents unlike some of the other projects that have happened recently. Um, I joined late, so I missed quite a bit. And I want to just raise the issue of parking and ensuring that there's going to be sufficient parking for those that do have no other option but to drive for one reason or another, whether they're coming from out of town. 
um, to go to a specialty uh, shop. Um, I've had some conversations with people that are very concerned about what will happen with the jewelry store, with the fish markets, and um, hoping that as part of this, there will be consideration for retaining parking so we can keep the small businesses alive. Thanks, Joan. Yeah, we've heard a good bit about that as well. Appreciate the comment. Um, next up is Alan. Hi, yes, thanks. Um, I just wanted to echo um, Phyllis's points uh, about local businesses. Um, I, there, there have been some comments in the chat that I thought were very um, important about um, changes that are already underfoot um, that weren't included in your slides. Um, um, and the, the Green Line extension, it seems to me, is really a very important one, uh, along with uh, all of the, the stuff that's happening, um, say, at Columbia and Cambridge. Um, I, I think it's important. Um, I, I, you've pitched this as our Cambridge Street, which great. I think we all affirm that. Um, but they're really a series. Uh, one of your slides had this point. They're really a series of, of smaller communities along this street. Um, and I, I think one thing that, that it seems likely to happen is that um, there are going to be uh, nodes of development um, that we need to manage and incorporate um, and do that in a way that doesn't challenge some of the smaller existing organic communities. Um, so I, I guess th that would be really one important point. I mean, you've got a chance to do some really brilliant uh, urban planning, say around the Green Line extension area. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I think a lot of the things that we like most about Cambridge Street, it's a really organic, you know, these are a series of uh, small organic communities. And uh, I, I, I think if you look at where uh, urban planning has done well in Cambridge versus where it hasn't, um, you know, that, that might be something that, that would give us some direction here. I mean, uh, Lafayette, Park, Lafayette Square, I don't think is a really good example of urban planning in Cambridge. I think it uh, took a lot of the organic character of, of that particular uh, intersection away. Um, but um, that's just a suggestion that, that, that you know, that as you build up your slides to incorporate these, these changes and the ways in which uh, individual smaller parts of Cambridge Street are unique and uh, we want to sort of keep their character. So, I mean, it's a, a matter of building on kind of the organic character that Cambridge Street already has is, is sort of what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. Yes, good. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, we've talked about that internally too, that, you know, maybe down the line, whatever the recommendations come to pass or not, um, a one size fits all for the entire length of the corridor to really think about the different nodes along the corridor and how we can celebrate what's already happening there. And that's what Stacy was trying to get at with the mix of businesses and those two blow up of circles. You know, it's a very different character in Inman Square than it is in, in Lehigh and in East Cambridge and how do we kind of speak to those things and celebrate what's there already. So um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, and we are certainly, oh, go ahead. Oh. Sorry, no, I just wanted to, I think someone else is raising their hand, Sarah. Um, yeah, so I just sure. wanted to make sure that that was on the radar, you, yeah. you know, and then I didn't have anything more to say. So if you wanted to finish. All right, um, Sarah, you should be able to um, unmute yourself now. Sarah Mayburn. Yeah, you're still muted, Sarah, unfortunately. It's, there should be at the bottom panel, a little mute and unmute microphone. Um, and while we're waiting, um, we are running out of time. There are a couple of questions in the chat that uh, we wanted to address. Um, one of them is, when do you expect to start all of the reconstruction of Cambridge Street and how many years are projected? I'm gonna, sure. I'm gonna give that one to Drew. I think Cambridge Street is one of the corridors that's identified on the longer term time frame. let's say. I think when we're in a bed before, it's five to six years before they begin any sort of construction on Cambridge Street beyond what you're seeing now in Inman Square. And the duration of construction for that, I do not know. <laughs> um, but to your question about, you know, for the length of Cambridge Street, what is the construction timeline? Um, based on the five-year infrastructure plan that Public Works has, um, I think it'll be within that time frame, another five years probably. But things are changing, so I can't give you the, the definitive answer, but that's my understanding. Uh, there is one question pertaining. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. 
Yes. Okay. Um, I've lived uh, on Fayette Street since 1958. And what I'm concerned about is the lack of not just trees, because all your slides show trees in full bloom, which doesn't happen all year round, but the lack of park space. Your maps, for example, Donnelly Field, show the old Harrington School and adjacent buildings, not the new uh, Cambridge Street Upper School, um, uh, King Open, and the new library, uh, and other buildings in back of that. Donnelly Field is now a postage stamp of what it used to be. And this is very serious issue for um, this part of the city, which is quite dense, which is why I'm very concerned that the Envision Cambridge idea is that we make th this area denser. And I ask you only to look at the tower that one can see from Union Square, which is probably a 20 story building. I think it's just the uh, uh, elevator shaft, but that's what the kind of building is gonna be. It's gonna block a view, it's gonna block sunlight. It's, I don't want that on, in, on Ch Cambridge Street, that, uh, that the street will be, look like downtown New York. And frankly, that's what I'm afraid Envision Cambridge promises. Also, uh, I hope your plan includes the businesses, um, the business block in Inman Square up to Fayette Street, because uh, it's, if you say just Inman Square and count it from Hampshire Street East, that doesn't include a very important block of small stores um, between Hampshire and Fayette. And they're having trouble because of lack of parking. Now I ride my bike. I can ride it to the fish market in East Cambridge. I ride it to Harvard Vanguard uh, West down Cambridge Street. So I'm sympathetic to the bikers, but I also agree with the person who said before that bikers, I think it was Phyllis, race through. And that's, that's not very good at all. Also, they wear black in both the daylight and nighttime, so you can't see them. And I wish, they were, I wish they were licensed. I think it's wonderful to ride a bike. I'd be happy to get a license if the city did that. But uh, the city seems bent on putting a building, whether it's a Cambridge building or a private building on every spare space of open space. And we're already one of the densest cities in the country. And frankly, I don't see the need for any more density. I know people talk about affordable housing. I think what they should talk about is middle class housing, not affordable housing, affordable housing. So if you get if you get a better job, you get kicked out. I mean, and then what's happening in the uh, building that somebody mentioned, I think it's uh, either Webster or Columbia and Cambridge Street, where there used to be a, um, a, a um, gravestone um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. operation. Uh, and um, it's now empty and uh, construction it looks imminent. And uh, it's, I think, twice as big as the place that was burnt out across, uh, near the uh, new school. And um, what's going in there? Is it going to be tall? God help us. Uh, it'll rob sunlight and air from all its neighbors. And the other thing you mentioned was uh, that delivery trucks, particularly big, big vans, take up space on the street and block where the bikes have to go. They also block where cars can go. Um, it's, uh, it's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> yeah. And I hope, now somebody was talking in the Globe, I think, today about building housing near where subway stations are or public transit is. That's a good idea because that would mean people would have less need to have cars in the city. Yeah. And I know friends in New York who plan that way. They, they live near tra public transit and they don't have to have a car, which is expensive in any city. Okay. Anyway, good luck. Thank you so much for <laughs> your Sarah. Um, Sarah May. Sarah May, so, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, well, it's 7.15, so I'm going to maybe discuss next steps. Um, this has been a really great conversation, and thanks to the Interface team for helping us facilitate it. They've done a tremendous amount of work, which we deeply appreciate, and it's been a fun process today, getting out and meeting a lot of 
the folks on this call that I never would have met otherwise possibly. So that's been really fun. And it's, I think, you know, speaking on behalf of my colleagues and CDD, that's really the more rewarding portion of this is to actually get out there and talk to people. So I know that um, we're all going through some tough times and having to do this sort of work remotely, which is challenging, but we hope to see you face to face again soon. Um, so this is, you know, obviously the first virtual meeting that we've had. Um, we'll be doing another um, kind of pop-in, so to speak, tomorrow night, a second Thursday event in Inman Square, um, along with our economic development division, who is there, is there regularly. Um, but that's sort of a bigger, you know, holiday event if you guys want to pet in. We did not sponsor the petting zoo, but I think there's going to be an alpaca there. But that'll be another opportunity to chat with us if you're in the neighborhood and want to talk to us one-on-one -on -one and didn't get a chance to tonight. Um, the next virtual engagement that we'll have will be kind of end of January, early February. And I think that's where we're going to be giving you more comprehensive feedback of everything we've heard between this meeting, between our pop-up engagement events, the survey, and really kind of roll up our sleeves and start having a work session of sorts. So we can begin kind of outlining and illustrating what some of the broader goals are and um, even some sort of specific questions that might come up. Um, but this schedule does give you an idea of, of where we're headed. You saw this earlier in the presentation as well. Um, oh, also one more plug for taking the online survey. <laughs> I have to put that out there. There it is. Take our survey. Um, and we're astounded that we've had, you know, 400 plus responses and it's only been out there for a few weeks. So it just shows kind of the interest that people have in Cambridge Street, their affection towards it. And, you know, how everyone realizes how these unique neighborhoods really help to sort of form such an incredible street that we all really value. And I uh, can't wait to kind of craft a vision with you guys. Um, so that's all we have tonight. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can email me, you can call me on the phone. Um, happy to get back to anyone and have a chat. So this presentation will be posted online. Um, and if you need a paper copy, email me. I can print one out and bring it to someone if they need it. So thanks a lot, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much for your input. Um, and if you could tell your neighbors that this process is happening, uh, we do our best to kind of spread the word as much as possible through all of the different kind of um, venues we can, but word of mouth is also really helpful. So um, please, um, the many and the more people that can get involved in this process, the better. Um, thank you so much. Thanks folks, take care of yourselves. Good night, Bye. everyone. Mm-hmm.